Christine Crono will be talking on the fat revolution and she will be talking about many topics covered in her exceptional book. In her book, she addresses why did she use the term the fat revolution? And she says, because the majority of women and many men struggle with their weight if they eat a low fat diet, because people diagnosed with heart disease often receive exactly the wrong advice for their health, because we are suffering from man-made diseases, i.e. nutritional diseases, that we can really only correct by changing what we eat. So, having a good time? Now, of course, you are here for my very favourite topic, as Tim Noakes said, saturated fat. So I love talking about it. Now, most of us are pretty familiar with conventional health guidelines. They are still asking us to reduce our fat, especially saturated fat. And many of you have probably been doing that most of your lives. So you might find this topic confronting, but hopefully a little bit exciting at the same time. Others of you may have heard now, especially today, that saturated fat might be good for us but you might feel nervous to try it, or you might be wondering, well, how much is too much? And then, of course, some of you are sitting there in suspense at the idea that you can get a free pass to eat butter and bacon again. So whatever you're thinking or feeling, I will show you why the low-fat movement was a huge mistake, why you'll never have to diet again, and why, in fact, the vilification of fat has been the biggest health mistake in history. Now, for those of you who haven't seen me speak before, you may be wondering, looking at me, whether I've even been on a diet in my life. I get that a lot, but this was me in my early 20s, and I did start struggling with my weight around 18. And of course, I tried all kinds of diets. Now, I normally started my diet on a Monday. Anyone else do that? <laughs> now, of course, Tuesday was always easier, and, be and that's because by then my diet was well and truly over. Now you might think, well, she looks all right now, but wait till she has a couple of kids and hits that middle-age spread. Now, well, this is me at 44 after my two gorgeous children, one of whom is in his third year of university. And I've been this weight for over a decade. I never have to think about how much I eat. I never count calories. I never ever diet. <laughs> and I love to eat. And I eat all of those forbidden foods, butter, bacon, eggs, whipped cream, the whole thing. In fact, some of you would be shocked at just how indulgent I am with my food. My husband once saw my breakfast plate and said, wow, that looks like a truckie's breakfast. <laughs> and that's because it looks something like this. Of course, I think it had a bit of bacon on the side as well. Now, I love what I do because it is making a profound difference in people's lives. I receive daily success stories, not just about weight loss, but all kinds of improved health conditions. Everything from acne to Hashimoto's. And in the 10 plus years that I've studied health and nutrition, I've discovered that the majority of our health messages are incorrect. So how did we get it so wrong? Well, I'm going to show you a fun little video clip from the brilliant documentary Fathead, which explains it beautifully. If you could pack all of human history into one year, we've only been farming and eating grain since about yesterday, which is when we became shorter and fatter. We only started consuming processed vegetable oils about 10 minutes ago, which is when heart disease became our number one killer. So after examining all this human history, the experts came to the obvious conclusion. We need to eat a lot more of these. And so they convinced us that human health depends on foods we didn't eat for more than 99% of our entire existence. How did this happen? In the 1950s, a biochemist named Ansel Keys published a study that compared heart disease and fat consumption in a half dozen countries. The more fat, the more heart disease. The trend line was unmistakable. Just one little problem. He's left out countries where people eat a lot of fat but have very little heart disease, like Holland and Norway. He also left out countries where people don't eat much fat but do have a lot of heart disease, like Chile. In fact, Keys had reliable data from 22 countries and the results were all over the place. But you can't make a big splash in the scientific community with a trend line that looks like this. So Keyes did what any dedicated researcher would do. He threw out the data that didn't fit and published his results. 
His punishment for this bit of scientific chicanery was to get his picture on the cover of Time magazine. Keyes became known as the father of the lipid hypothesis, which says that eating saturated fat raises the cholesterol in your blood, and high cholesterol in your blood clogs your arteries and causes heart disease. Now, did anyone notice what's called a hypothesis? And it's still called that today. It was simply an idea that was never proven. And in fact, hundreds of studies have now shown absolutely no correlation between saturated fat intake and heart disease. Now, what few people know is that we've been eating saturated fat for millions of years without the heart disease, without the obesity. Those are very new problems. That's why we call it chronic modern disease. So these really only popped up in the 1900s. Now, the skeptics love to say, yes, but when we were hunter-gatherers, we didn't actually live very long. We only lived till we were 30, right? Well, that's not actually the case. The science actually shows us that if we survived the natural elements like saber-toothed tigers, we actually lived a very long time. And in fact, our longevity shortened once we started eating grain and other modern food. We also got shorter and fatter, and that's not all. It wasn't just our health that was declining. Our physical attributes changed as well. So if you look at these beautiful African children with their wide faces and straight teeth, when we changed our diet, our jaw started to narrow, which causes crooked teeth. But other malformations are extremely common. You start to see overbites, underbites, large protruding foreheads. Now, I know it seems shocking, but this is simply a case of malnutrition. So if we've been healthy and robust for all these millions of years, what happened in the 1900s especially to change that? It's been blamed on saturated fat, so did we suddenly start eating more? We didn't. In fact, saturated fat consumption came right down. But we did start eating vegetable oil, margarine, shortening, and we started mass-producing sugar. And in fact, between 1890 and 1920, sugar consumption doubled. And that's because we saw these very first confectionery companies. By 1926, we had our very first documented case of a heart attack. And by the 1950s, heart disease was common. And it had experts scrambling for a solution. Unfortunately, they picked the wrong one. So what is the truth about saturated fat? Well, surprisingly, saturated fat is not what's making us fat. Now, how can that be if it's got more calories than protein and carbohydrate? Well, different calories actually act differently in the body. Some prompt our body to store fat, and some don't. That's why it's meaningless to count them, because they act differently. And in fact, surprisingly, saturated fat is the least likely food to possibly cause any kind of fat storage. So what's the real culprit? Well, when we eat sugar and carbohydrate, we have to, of course, produce insulin, which then takes the glucose where it needs to go in the body. But the important thing is we can only use or store a very small amount at any one time. So if we eat more than that, we have to store the rest as fat in most cases. Now, especially once we got rid of all the fat, what did we have to replace it with? Sugar and carbohydrates. So we're eating more now than we ever have before in history. So, of course, we're producing more and more insulin, and we have to store more and more fat. And, of course, we then become insulin resistant. We have to produce even more insulin again. So it's a real problem. And then we get to a point where we've got this glucose trapped in our bloodstream. We can't even get it to where it needs to go. And what happens then if we can't get it into the brain? Well, our brain cells start to die, and then we have Alzheimer's. So no matter what we hear in the media, this disease is completely preventable, as are most other modern diseases. So fat's not what's making us fat, but what about heart disease? I mean, experts insist on a direct link between saturated fat intake and heart disease. But the scientists have been very surprised to find that the buildup in our arteries is not actually saturated fat. It's actually mostly polyunsaturated fat, which, where does that come from? all those heart-healthy vegetable oils. And the other thing is that study after study shows us that sugar and excess carbohydrates increases risk for heart disease. And it does this in a couple of different ways, one of which I'll cover later on in the presentation. But one very interesting way 
is that we, if we do have all this sugar trapped in our bloodstream, it does change the consistency of our blood. So it becomes quite irritating. So we, especially the, the very delicate vessels around the heart. So we can end up with little irritations or scrapes in there. We have to put a scab on that. Is that going to be a problem? And of course, then that might get irritated. Then we have to put another scab on it. So eventually, we're starting to build up in the arteries. Now, it's called acute thrombosis, and it's why many diabetics have limbs removed, and it's also why most diabetics will actually die from heart disease. And what do our health experts continually tell us to do? To eat low-fat products loaded with sugar. So saturated fat is not making us fat. It's not causing heart disease. But what happens if we go on a low-fat diet? Is that bad for us? What do you guys think? Absolutely. And that's because saturated fat especially, fat and cholesterol are essential for the body for so many different processes. In fact, it's essential for most bodily functions. Now, I'm just going to run through a few of, those, few of those. For example, our cells. Our cell membrane is made up of around 50% saturated fat. So imagine telling us not to eat saturated fats when our cell membrane is made of the stuff. Now, the other thing, and this is probably one of the most important things to take away, Cholesterol heals. It's a healing mechanism. So say we do have inflammation. Say we have been on a high carbohydrate diet, we've got inflammation, we've got calcification of the arteries, our cholesterol is likely to come up because it's trying to heal the damage. So what happens then if we then try and take that cholesterol away? We've taken away our only protection we did have from heart disease. How ironic is that? The other thing is we need it for all our organs, like our lungs and our brain. Our brain is around 50% saturated fat. We also need it for our emotions. We need it for energy, which is why fatigue is such an issue these days. By the way, why do you think it is that more women tend to suffer with fatigue than men? It's because we listen to conventional health guidelines. We try and do the right thing. And of course, men tend to do whatever they want, <laughs> which actually helps them out immensely in this area. But unfortunately, the doctor often gets them later with cholesterol medication. But yes, we try and do the right thing, so we end up more fatigued, more sick. Now, we need it for our sex hormones. We need it for our reproduction, which is why fertility is such an issue, especially when we try and go super low fat. Fertility just goes out the window. Now, the other thing is that this lack of fat and cholesterol in our diet is making us age much faster than we should be. There are three reasons why we are aging faster now than we ever have before in history. Firstly, if we don't have that fat and cholesterol for that cell membrane, if we can't keep that cell membrane strong, then we actually can't keep hydration in the cell. So we start to wrinkle. Same thing with vegetable oils, that actually damages the cell membrane, especially margarines. And then again, that causes wrinkles. And sugar is also the number one ager. It destroys our collagen. Now the other thing to think about is that if we then lower our cholesterol with a drug, we've increased our risk for muscle damage, brain damage, impotency and cancer. And the other thing we've increased our risk for is, wait for it, heart disease. Now, how surprising is that? Now, that's because those drugs very effectively lower our cholesterol, but they increase our risk of atherosclerosis by three. Interesting, right? Now, the other thing is that if that low cholesterol itself increases our risk for premature death, and that's a fact that's never been contradicted in any scientific study or paper. So why does no one know about it? It's because cholesterol medication is the biggest selling prescription medication in the world. Scary, right? Now, hopefully we've established that we need fat and cholesterol, but can we have too much of it? What do you guys think? I know you want to say yes or no. 
They're too scared. Well, surprisingly, the answer is no, we can't. And I know that's going to be a shock. But there's a few different reasons. Firstly, when we eat fat, we produce our fullness hormone, CCK. So it's when we take away the fat, we've got a huge problem, right? That's why we can eat an entire packet of biscuits or cookies and then go to the fridge afterwards and say, what's there to eat? Now, it's a completely different story with fat. That's why you can start your day with three eggs, bacon, camembert cheese, butter, and you can easily go till two or three in the afternoon without eating. So the other thing is that primal groups like the Inuit or the Maasai, they actually thrived on extremely high fat diets. So around 70 or 80 percent of their calories as fat. And they had no sign of heart disease, no sign of obesity. Now I know this is a hard concept to get our head around, so hopefully this will make you feel better. In addition to other fats, our family does consume over two kilos of butter every single week. And as you can see, it's not causing a weight issue. Now, just in case you think that we're exercising it off, it's not even about the exercise. And that's because if we are fattening ourselves with the wrong foods, no amount of exercise is going to help. That's why you can go to any gym anywhere in the country and see the same people week after week doing the same thing and their weight doesn't change. It's also why you can see elite athletes who are overweight. They hardly need more exercise, right? And in fact, Terry here is a fantastic example because she always loved to exercise. She was exercising on the left and she was exercising on the right. But the results of that exercise did not show until she changed her diet. So how are we all feeling? Still breathing? Yeah. <laughs> now, of course, People often find this information life-changing, and why wouldn't you? It's an end to dieting, it's an end to deprivation, it's an end to all that rubbish. But of course, you'll go home and there'll be lots of voices around you to tell you why low-carb, high-fat has got to be dangerous. So I'm going to run through some of the most common objections you're likely to hear about why this diet is probably going to kill you. Now, uh, Unfortunately for the people who were in the medical conference, I did run through some of these things before, but fortunately, they're really fascinating, so you'll enjoy it. So firstly, the first thing they often say is, if it tastes good, it must be bad for you, right? Now, let's think about this for a second. How ridiculous. How did we become the only species on Earth that decided we needed to eat a tasteless, boring diet that we were not attracted to in any way in order to be healthy and a good weight? Do we see animals having to be coached on how they need to eat? Or do they just know what they need to go for? Now, we are attracted to fat because it's good for us. We actually crave it because we need it. Now, you might be thinking, well, what about the sweets? We also like the sweets, right? But back in the day, we only had access to certain sweets. So that kind of told us if something was safe to eat, if it was sweet, it wasn't toxic. But now, of course, sweets are everywhere, and that's a bit of a problem. But back to the fat, we crave fat because we need it. Now, this is a big one, and of course, having a blog where you know, I'm saying a controversial message, I often get people or trolls on my website, right? Now, I can't tell you how many times people have said to me, man, I'd hate to see your insides. Well, I hate to break it to them, but it's actually the other way around. And that's because loads of excess fibre, which they've told us we need, is actually extremely damaging for the bowel. And in fact, does anyone know how it makes us regular? It actually has to tear holes, the roughage tears holes in our bowel wall, which releases a mucus which helps everything pass through. How fantastic! <laughs> now, Unfortunately, not only is that extremely damaging, but it creates a fibre dependence. And then what happens if you go low carb, high fat? You take away all that fibre that you're dependent on, what happens? And then, of course, the sceptic says, well, see, I told you, the diet was bad for you. But it's not actually the diet, it's the fibre damage. Now, if we've only got a small amount of fibre damage, 
then low carb high fat's extremely healing because fat's extremely nourishing for the bowel. Those people with the most fat in their diets have the healthiest bowels, for sure. And in fact, people sometimes take coconut oil and it helps everything happen. Now, <laughs> but if there's a lot of damage, and unfortunately that's the case for a lot of people these days, then we have to really support that bowel while it heals. Now I've written very easy solutions for how to do that in the fat revolution, but it's important to do it, otherwise we can stockpile around five kilos of extra waste in our bowel. Not only that, we start recirculating toxins. It's not a healthy place to be. So it's really important. Now there's one other huge benefit to getting rid of all this excess insoluble fibre. Anyone know what it is? Shout it out. I know it, you guys know it. You're not even shouting it out. It's bleating in gas. Now, I remember watching an Oprah show once where they challenged the entire staff to go vegan for a week. Biggest complaint was gas. Now, they tried to say it's going to get better in time. It doesn't. And that's because insoluble fibre is indigestible by humans, which means we have to ferment it with bacteria in the bowel. The byproduct of that is gas. There's no way to get around it, just how it happens. So, has anyone noticed that babies don't need fibre to eliminate? And cats and dogs don't need fibre to eliminate? And neither do we. And I often say that low carb high fat is about freedom. Well, I can tell you this is one of the biggest freedoms there is. So what about, what about eliminating whole grains and food groups? Have you guys all heard this in the media? why this is dangerous and in fact very recently one of our health authorities came out and said that the paleo diet and also in other articles low carb high fat is dangerous because we're eliminating whole grains. So I actually went to that health authority and I said can you please tell me what nutrients we will be missing if we eliminate whole grains and they said you're right you're going to be missing nutrients and these are the nutrients. So I went back and I said well actually we can get all those nutrients from these places, so can you tell me again, what nutrients are we going to be missing if we don't have whole grains? Now, of course, there was complete silence after that. I never heard another thing, and we couldn't get an answer because there isn't one. There simply is no nutrient that we can't get from other sources if we do not eat whole grains in our diet. Now, the other thing about whole grains is, remember I was talking about the excess insoluble fiber? But of course, like you've also heard from other speakers, they're full of plant toxins. And these plant toxins are there to protect them against birds and insects. But they also act like allergens in our digestive system. And primal groups that ate small amounts of whole grain actually soaked and fermented those grains so that they were more digestible, something we've forgotten how to do. Not only that, they want us to eat between 6 and 11 serves every single day. Is it any wonder that we've got an absolute epidemic of IBS, leaky gut and all kinds of digestive issues? And the other thing is, of course, if I ate the minimum of six, that I know I'd be overweight, no question. Because these excess grains make us fat, it's just too much. Now this one's very similar, in fact, recently a dietitian came out uh, in a public forum and said, I think low carb, high fat is actually abuse when you're feeding it to children because they're not getting their nutri nutritional requirements. But what they don't understand is if you start your day with eggs and tomato and butter, you've already packed yourself full of vitamins A, B, C, D, E and K and all kinds of other nutrients. In addition to that, if we add unrefined salt, we've got a whole load of other minerals. This is an extremely nutrient-dense diet, far more nutrient-dense than a low-fat, whole-grain-based diet. And the other thing they've forgotten is that fat itself is nutrient-dense. There are some nutrients we're not getting anymore because we've gotten rid of the fat. One of those is vitamin K2. Now, remember I was talking about the narrow jaws, bone development? That's caused by a lack of vitamin K2 because we got rid of the fats. Now the other thing that vitamin K2 does is it protects us from heart disease. If we do have calcification of the arteries because we've been on a Western diet, 
Vitamin K2 comes through and helps clear that out. So yes, I'm going to say it, fatty food like butter, pastured egg yolks and soft cheeses helps protect us from heart disease. Ironic, yes? Now, a lot of the comments we get sometimes are that, well, you're relying on a lot of acid-forming foods like meat, dairy, and eggs. Has anyone heard that one? Now, is it actually true, and what are they actually talking about? Well, they're talking about the body's pH, which is just the concentration of oxygen and hydrogen. If we have too much hydrogen, we have less oxygen. Now, you can imagine why this would be not a good idea for our cells to have less oxygen. But what happens when we become acidic, and I can tell you it's not on a low-carb, high-fat diet, but it's from a low-fat, high-carb diet, we do become acidic, and we change our entire metabolism. So we actually change. A lot of people say we naturally burn sugar for energy, and we need it, right? Because we need it for our energy. But we actually naturally burn fat for energy. But when we take in sugar all the time, when we start taking in sugar, we have to burn it off to get rid of it. It's not good for us, we need to get rid of it. But what happens if we keep putting it in? We become permanent sugar burners. Now, of course, we end up with less oxygen to our cells, we end up with a diseased environment, and we become a breeding ground for candida and fungus. Now, you don't have to look very far to see that this is an issue, right? Think about all the ads on TV for those creams for athlete's foot and thrush and all kinds of other fungal problems. It's not because we stepped on something in the bathroom floor, it's because we've got candida on the inside. Now the other thing is that we start having connective tissue breakdown. Now this is especially important for athletes and it's often why many athletes have such a short career. Because we think as we get older that, you know, we start to have injuries. we actually got connective tissue breakdown in a lot of cases. Now, the other thing that happens is, of course, uh, collagen is a connective tissue. So we get premature ageing. And now, now I'm going to talk about what I was speaking about before. If this is the only thing you take away today, this is the important one. All right, now when we're in this situation, as most of you know, our blood actually can't become acidic, otherwise we die. We have to keep it alkalised. So if we're generally becoming acidic by eating foods that are acid forming in the body, then we have to try and buffer it all the time. One of our extreme buffering systems is to pull phosphate from the bones. Now what happens? What do we pull with that phosphate? Calcium. So that's the real reason for the epidemic of osteoporosis. We're pulling calcium from our bones from a very young age. I mean, how many of us had tooth decay at a young age? And any time we have tooth decay, it's a sign of bone loss. And I can tell you, I had a whole mouthful of them. Now, that's not even my real point. What happens then when we use the phosphate to buffer the body? Then we've got this free calcium roaming around the body. Now, calcium needs to be bound in order to be safe in the body. When it's not bound and it's free, it actually goes around calcifying things. What could possibly go wrong here? So think about our heart valves or our arteries. What about gallstones? We're often told that a high-fat diet causes gallstones, but actually, a low-fat diet causes gallstones, and we're calcifying the cholesterol in our gallbladder. What about kidney stones, bone spurs, arthritis? It's a huge problem. And of course, then this leads to chronic disease, such as heart disease or cancer. So yes, it is a huge problem. So we do need to look at our pH. Uh, now, if you're testing your pH, say you test it with saliva or something like that. If you test it and it's 7, then it's neutral. If it's above 7, then it's alkalised. If it's below 7, and most people will find after a Western-style diet, they'll be around 5.5, quite acidic. Now, 
back to the original point, why do they say meat, dairy and eggs are acid forming? Probably because they're acids. Now why are they acids? Well, because they're full of amino acids and fatty acids. Now, I'm sure most of you have heard the term essential amino acids and essential fatty acids, right? We are meant to consume these acids. And in fact, if we go and look at something that's even more acidic on the scale, on the pH scale, what about lemons, limes and apple cider vinegar? Do we ever see big headlines telling us, you know, you've got to watch those lemons? They're going to make you acidic? <laughs> of course not. And in fact, the fantastic acids like malic acid in those lemons, limes and apple cider vinegar actually prompt our body to produce bicarbonate, and that alkalizes the body. Now, what about something that's not acidic when it goes in, such as sugar? Well, it actually produces acid in the body, so it's acid forming. What about something like grains? It's a little bit acidic when it goes in, but it's also acid forming in the body. So it's really nothing to do with whether it's an acid when it goes in your mouth, it's the biochemistry of what happens in the body to that food. Now, back to the meat, dairy and eggs, not only do they consume acids that also help produce bicarbonate in the body, but they also help the kidneys to eliminate acids. And in fact, if we don't eat enough quality protein, it's very hard to keep the body alkalized because we can't concentrate those acids in the kidneys and get rid of them. So not only is meat not acid forming, it's actually alkalizing. Now one other thing I must mention is aspartame. Aspartame is also acid forming. And in fact, there's a doctor, this is just off topic for a second, but there's a doctor in Brisbane who specializes in MS. And he says that over 70% of the patients who are referred to him for MS symptoms do not have MS at all. They have aspartame poisoning. So it's extremely toxic and acid forming. So what's the best way to actually alkalize the body after all that? Well, it's to eat low carb, high fat, and to take a daily lemon drink in the morning with lemons, limes, and apple cider vinegar. Now if apple cider vinegar is too strong, and it is for some people, then lemon is the strongest alkalizer. I do have an ebook online that explains all this in much more detail if you would like to look into it further. Now this is closely related to the next one. How many times do we see this in the media? Every couple of years we have a giant study that comes out and says meat causes cancer. But the fantastic thing about the internet is that we can actually go and look at these studies. We can look at the data and read it. Now this particular study that said these things, well, having a look at the data, the people who died earlier from heart disease and cancer smoked more, exercised less, were more diabetic, more hypertensive, ate more in general, ate more white bread and pasta, ate less vegetables and fruit, took less vitamins, and they ate more red meat. <laughs> it's obvious, isn't it? Now, I don't know about you, but if I was a researcher and people could read my data and I'd come up with that conclusion, I definitely would be embarrassed. But they do this all the time. And then the public, that's all they see. Red meat causes cancer. Now, this is the next one. Isn't sugar essential? Now, I already talked about the fact that it's not our preferred energy source, but if we are using fat as our preferred energy source, we actually convert fatty acids into ketones. Now, ketones has become a dirty word, right? But actually, ketones are a fantastic energy source, and most of our ancestors would have been on some sort of ketogenic diet because they simply didn't have the access to carbohydrate to live any other way. Not the amounts that we have today. Now, interestingly, the brain actually runs best on a mixture of ketones and glucose. So you might be thinking, well, Okay, but still, don't we need the glucose? Doesn't that make sugar essential? But actually, there's no situation that we're not going to be getting that glucose into our brain. Even if we have no carbohydrate at all, 
the liver actually converts amino acids to glucose. And that's why we shouldn't eat too much protein, right? Because it can then start acting like a carbohydrate. The good news, however, is that if we are really high fat, and I mean high fat, a lot of people think they're high fat till they go out and have a meal with me. <laughs> and then they go, oh, I, I misunderstood. <laughs> so once we're high fat, then we tend not to overdo the protein because we just can't. You can't fit any more in, right? Now, this book is a fantastic example because Dr. Stephenson went and lived with the Inuits for 15 years in the early 1900s and he was fascinated by their lifestyle because they just ate meat, fish and blubber. And they were extremely robust and healthy. So even though we like to add a little bit of carbohydrate here and there for colour and texture and all the rest of it, we don't actually need it. It's not essential to the body. Now, this is one of my favourites. We're almost to the end. She has a good metabolism. It will not work for you. I've heard that. I can't... I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. Now, do I have a fantastic metabolism? Well, actually, I grew up on a very high carbohydrate diet because we were extremely poor. We were lucky to have two boiling chickens between the nine of us on a Sunday for a treat. So we didn't have much protein, we didn't have much fat. So I grew up really skinny like many other poor children. But once I hit 18, I started to spread. And this is actually very common, that's why if you go to third world countries, especially those that are reliant on white flour and sugar, you could see these obese women with tiny malnourished babies. So it's not my metabolism, but what about my genes? Well, this is my grandmother. She actually struggled with obesity and diabetes her entire life. Now, we only have this one photo of her because she refused to have her photo taken. You know, we all know what that's like, right? When we're heavier than we like, we don't really like to be in pictures. Well, she was extremely proud of herself because she got down to 82 kilos. Now, she did that because she went to the doctor and the doctor told her to eat nothing for three days, fast for three days, and then to go on a calorie-controlled diet, 600 calories a day. She did that for a long, long time. Of course, she lost the weight. She was extremely proud. But we all know that's unsustainable, right? You can't live on 600 calories a day for the rest of your life. So again, she gained the weight back plus interest. Now, the interesting thing about my grandmother is that she only ever had diet or low-fat food in the house, ever. But now, of course, we know that that food was making her fat. Extremely sad. We, she struggled with this her entire life and she was over 150 kilos when she died. What about my other grandmother? Now, she actually never became overweight because she refused to. She said she was never going to be over a size 12 and that was that. But she used to say, no, thank you. I have to watch my girlish figure. Now, we thought that was quite cute, you know. When I was 18, I thought, what a cute grandma, you know. But... How sad, she spent her entire life dieting. Now, of course, years later she had a stroke. And why do I say of course? Because we've known for a very long time that low-fat dieting, especially for extended periods, increases your risk for stroke. After she had her first stroke, she ate even less because she couldn't move, so she ended up having another stroke. Extremely sad. And of course, she also died prematurely. What about my own mother? Now, I remember her when I was growing up. She was always thin, but bless her, she followed in her mother's footsteps, always dieting. I remember her grapefruit diets. Anyone know that one? You know, the half a grapefruit for lunch with brown sugar on top, half for, oh, sorry, for breakfast, and then half for lunch, brown sugar on top again, and then a low-calorie dinner. How fantastic. But, and she was thin, but now she's over 90 kilos. And she hates it. She calls herself a fat pig. How common is that? It's really sad. So now, of course, she's damaged her metabolism. She's damaged her thyroid. She's damaged her hormones. So now she really has to go super, super, super low carb to be able to fix that. So I know for a fact, knowing my family history and also my metabolism, 
that if I had not changed my diet when I did, I would definitely be overweight now, if not obese. So this is the last one. If it's so fantastic, why doesn't it work for everybody? Well, I actually think it does work for everybody, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But there are some mistakes we can make on low carb, high fat that can prevent weight loss. Number one is constipation. Remember I said before we can hold around five kilos of waste in our bowel. Also, when we recirculate toxins in the system, we protect our organs from toxins by holding them in the fat cell. We're not going to want to get rid of our fat cells if we are holding onto toxins. The next one is artificial sweeteners. Again, they're very, very toxic. So we're going to be wanting to protect ourselves from the toxins, especially after a while, and we've had a lot of buildup. Aspartame toxicity is very well documented. Not balancing pH is another big mistake because some people who go low carb, high fat, they naturally balance their pH. It just happens, especially if they have acids in their diet, because it's a better diet. But if we don't have acids in our diet, then we do have to actually think about balancing our pH by taking a daily lemon drink, etc., etc. Again, if we are acidic, we hold acid waste in our fat cells, which means we're not going to want to let get rid of the fat. Now, to me, this is the most important one, healing. So this is especially relevant to many of the women out there. If we think about this, how many years have we all dieted? You know, most people start at a very young age. My daughter is 14, and she's got quite a few friends of hers who are dieting already. It's really sad. But when we diet, our thyroid has to slow down. Our metabolism has to slow down. And we start protecting our fat stores. We start using muscle for energy instead. We protect our fat stores. So what's that going to do when we go back onto normal eating, whether it's low carb, high fat or not? What are we going to do? We gain back the weight we lost plus maybe a bit extra. And that's normal. So sometimes we have to give ourselves time to heal. How many people out there have noticed that men tend to go on low carb, high fat, lose weight like that? And then the women are going, what? This is totally unfair. What's going on? But in most cases, men haven't spent their entire lives dieting. So we sometimes just need to think about that. Now, I had a woman who came to see me at one of my last seminars, and she said, it's been four weeks, nothing's happened. And I said, really, has nothing happened? She said, well, I'm type 2 diabetic, and my sugars have dropped. <laughs> and I said, so nothing's happened. So sometimes we're so focused on weight that we forget that we're actually healing. And she was healing. You know, her sugars had dropped. So how can we possibly say it's not working? And so many people have all these things, you know, they say their bloating goes away, their skin clears up, their hypertension goes away, their, you know, their blood markers improve, their arteries clear, but they haven't lost weight yet. <laughs> you know, so sometimes we just have to allow ourselves, especially women, time to heal so that the body can function the way it was meant to. Think about what it's been through and just allow it some time. So what's the answer after all this? Well, to me, it's low carb, high fat. But what is it? I mean, there are so many different variations out there. But to me, it's just finding your sweet spot. So if we know that we can only use or store a small amount of carbohydrate at any one time, what is that for you? So members of my website can actually go and calculate it dependent on their size because it, it depends on your size and also the state of your health. So you can calculate it. You can also calculate your fat and your protein intake. That's right for you. Now, I can guarantee you that most people, like I mentioned before, most people will be shocked at how much fat they actually can and should be eating in their diet. Now, the other thing is the state of our health. If we are insulin resistant, for example, we react completely differently to carbs than other people do, than healthy people do. For example, if you eat a sweet potato with uh, butter on it, etc., etc., if you're a healthy person, you might have a slight rise in glucose. If you're an insulin resistant person, that same sweet potato, you might have a massive rise in glucose. So it's very beneficial if you are healing or if you're insulin resistant 
to drop your carbs even lower than your ideal for a period, down to around 20 or 30 grams a day is fantastic. Now, if you do that for a period, if you do it for long enough, then you will remain in that fat burning state. And in fact, I was very unwell when I started low carb, high fat. So I actually did it for 12 months. I didn't probably need to do it that long, but I decided to do it. The interesting thing is that after being in that state for 12 months, I now eat sweet potato. I now eat some fruit. I stick to the non-sweet fruits, but I eat some fruit. I also eat muffins that I've made with buckwheat. I even eat potato, which shocks a lot of people. Of course, it's loaded with butter and sour cream and all the rest of it. And of course, every time you eat uh, carbohydrates, it's best to have it with fat because it slows down the digestion, stops that spike in blood sugar. But the interesting thing is that after being in that state for so long, I'm still in that ketogenic fat adapted state. And I have been for 14 years, even though I eat those small carbohydrates. So that's exciting, right? So to me, that's low carb, high fat. So in summary, fat is not what is causing the problem. It's not causing heart disease, it's not causing obesity, and it's actually sh sugar, excess sugar, excess carbohydrates, and vegetable oils that are the true culprits. And like I always say, I know sometimes it is easier to eat whatever we want, even if it does make us sluggish and heavier than we'd like, but at what cost? Most of us do plan our financial retirement, but we forget to plan our health. So please invest the time in your health today, and you can save immeasurable amounts of time later in life when others of a similar age are struggling with illness and disease. And if you can do that, eating butter, bacon, eggs, crispy duck, pork crackling and whipped cream, it's a no-brainer, right? It's been a pleasure, everyone.